The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the A3 webinar series. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Transitioning Your Manual and Labor-Intensive Processes to Automation. My name is Clarissa Carvalho, and I'm the Content Marketing Manager for the Association for Advancing Automation. I'll be serving as your moderator today. Attendees viewing this webinar are in listen-only mode, which means that you are muted. If you have questions during the webinar, please submit them in the questions panel at the right of your screen. We will try to address as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. And if your question is not addressed during the webinar, we will respond via email. This webinar is being recorded, and a link with the recording will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. This webinar series has been brought to you by the Association for Advancing Automation, also known as A3. A3 is the leading automation trade association in the world for robotics, vision and imaging, motion control and motors, and the industrial artificial intelligence technologies. We are your hub for all your automation resources, from products and partners to new applications, trainings and information on the latest technologies and innovations. You can visit automate.org to learn more. I'd like to thank our exclusive sponsor for today's webinar. Robot Master, a hypertherm brand, is an offline programming software for robots that helps manufacturers maximize productivity on production runs of all sizes. Robot Master makes programming parts of any complexity quick and easy as a result of its integrated CAD CAM functionality. This intuitive and powerful solution is designed with process experts in mind, reducing the need for programmers and robotic expertise. So thank you, Robot Master, for your sponsorship today. And I'd now like to introduce our four panelists for today's webinar. We first have Patrick Chelly, who is a software sales manager for Hypertherm. Octave Bruard is a product application engineer for Robot Master. Ron Bergman is a senior sales application engineer for KUKA Robotics. And Tyson Percival is president and engineering manager for Sync Robotics. So thank you for being with us today, gentlemen. And Patrick, I'll now give you the floor to start us off. Thank you, Clarissa. Uh, and thank you all for joining us and to KUKA and Sync for getting involved with the webinar. Uh, for the webinar, we wanted to focus on certain areas of manufacturing. We're seeing lots of interest in, in companies looking to automate and uh, also being hit hard by this skilled labor shortage. So we decided to walk through the typical buyer's journey of a company who's looking to take a manual labor intensive type task and automating it. We're going to give you the perspective of the robotic OEM integrator and offline programming software on how we all work together to deliver uh, a, sex, a successful automated system. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Ron from KUKA, and he's going to get us started with a market overview. Oh, thank you, Patrick. So I'm going to go over a market overview of what uh, we see in the marketplace today and what kind of challenges that come to us as a robotic OEM. So everywhere you go, you see help wanted signs. Everybody's looking for labor. I mean, the reality is we have a shortage of labor. A lot of different theories on the shortage. You know, the Amazon effect, early retirement, immigration issues, whatnot. But the reality is there's a shortage of labor and I don't think it's gonna change anytime soon. When you look at skilled labor, it becomes even more of an issue. I mean, not only is there a shortage of skilled labor, but the supply and demand is pushing up the of the cost of um, of the skilled labor itself. And really, there's no short-term fix that we have, so it's going to continue. So automation really helps customers stay competitive regarding the labor market. So when you introduce a human into the process, I mean, generally you're introducing errors, uh, manual errors. Um, so customers, when they want to produce higher quality or more repeatable parts, they really want to get the human out of the process, which again would force you into automation. I mean, the, the shortage of labor for dirty jobs is even worse or dangerous jobs. I mean, people are just looking at, you know, better jobs. Um, so when it comes to 
trying to recruit for people to clean windows, for example, it's just very difficult. And we actually have customers automate in that process. So for the end customer point of view, it could be you know reducing workplace injuries and overall uh, lowering costs with insurance, for example. You know, you see this in the news all over the place, uh, lots of media coverage. You know, we have a major supply chain issue. So it's really forcing customers to move their manufacturing closer to their customers. Um, again, no real short-term fix for this. Automation helps customers stay competitive in the marketplace today. We look at some of the manual processes that are, are really uh, key to uh, driving automation. Uh, moving material, I mean, every time a customer handles a product, it drives up the cost. You know, whether it's in a factory, a distribution center, you're moving product in or out of a building or within a building. Every time you touch it, it's gonna cost you money. So moving product around with an AGV, for example, could certainly help keep the cost down or reduce the cost. Material removal and cutting, and these can be some really nasty, dirty jobs. Again, the, the shortage of labor um, is driving customers to automate. Uh, it, it's very difficult today to recruit a person to um, you know, do a, a cutting job or a, re a, re a removal job. Um, it's it just, again, shortage of skilled labor and labor in general is driving it to autom automation. And these type of processes, uh, once you, um, once you automate them and you have a repeatable automation process, uh, you're getting the same part every time. So you could really control your, your quality of your part. It's even more difficult when you look at a welding process and these are very good processes to automate. I mean, there's definitely a shortage of laborers, um, shor shortage of welders for this type of process, but, but especially for certified welders. And the cost of welding cells, I mean, it, the cost has come down a lot for simple welding cells. So it's very cost effective for customers to go from a manual process to an automated process, even for small batch jobs. I'll hand it over to Tyson for the next section. Thanks, Ron. Hello everyone, I'm Tyson Percival. I'm the engineering manager here at Sync Robotics. We're a general industry robotics integrator in Western Canada. We build systems for a wide variety of processes, material handling, machine tending, palletizing, painting, many others. And so we end up seeing a lot of variety when it comes to robot systems. Through that, we've uh, learned a thing or two about going from a manual process to an automated one. So what does a robot integrator do and why do you wanna work with one? Well, um, put simply, an integrator's job is to build a robot system that's a winning investment. Uh, we judge our success on if a customer can look back five or 10 years later and say, going ahead with that project was a really good decision. A qualified integrator is a resource for small to medium-sized customers who don't have the in-house engineering experience or robotics training that we have. Um, we come in to augment a customer's team over the course of a project to reduce risk while saving time and money over a do-it-yourself approach. Each customer and each process is a little bit different. Uh, we have the robotics experience, but our customers are the experts when it comes to their manufacturing requirements. So in order to get the best results, ongoing collaboration between both sides is really needed. So there's three main categories of requirements that usually come up when looking at, an auto, at automating a manual process. Um, what are we trying to accomplish with automation? How should we accomplish it? And most importantly, how are we gonna pay for all this? A uh, robotic system doesn't make any business sense if the return on investment can't really be quantified. So often these three categories are best guided by three different groups of people. Um, that would be engineering and production for the process, supervisors and maintenance for the implementation, and management or capital projects for the ROI. So again, the best projects do come from good collaboration with all these stakeholders. When working with customers, we frequently see similar themes. Um, typically, we'll be working to automate an existing process while creating some additional capacity for future expansion. 
uh, we'll be looking to fit that automated system into the same floor space as an existing process. We'll need to ensure the system can be operated and maintained with minimal additional training. And finally, we often see return on investment requirements from our customers between one and three years. And that's usually just looking at labor savings. And uh, now I'll pass it back to Ron to talk a little bit about how we select the right robot for the job. Oh, thank you, Tyson. So I'm going to go into what we typically deal with as a robotic OEM. Just to build on Tyson's comments, I mean, the first question I usually ask, you know, who's your partner for the automation? Because selecting an integrator that has experience and it might be in your location could save you a lot of time and money. Uh, generally, for end users trying to automate on their own, it means you can save money, but you're certainly not going to save time. And if you want to reduce your project risk and ensure the safety of your cell and your people, uh, you want to have a good partner. So just, just like people, robots come in different sizes and shapes. And when we're trying to fit a robot to the requirements, we're typically looking at uh, the mass of the package we're trying to move around, the cell layout, which would dictate the reach of the robot and what kind of production production cycle do you need? How many parts per minute or per second, for example? And we could do a simulation study to determine if the reach is okay. Uh, we can do a cycle time study to determine if we can fit the production cycle. So you get into sizing some of the more difficult applications like milling and grinding or polishing, for example. You're dealing with process forces, so you wanna make sure you're not overloading the robot the process force. Uh, you have uh, part tolerances to deal with, so you want to make sure the robot system or the application itself is suitable for the tolerance, and you have environmental conditions. So you could be trying to protect the robot itself from spray of chemicals, water, or even equipment within the cell. When you're trying to reduce your project risk, I mean, you really, uh, I'm building on Tyson's comments also, now you really need to understand your process and the requirements for your, your product you're trying to make. And sometimes um, you can change the part tolerance to keep your cost down. A lot of times we'll see a manual process uh, and you know it's not being, the part in the manual process is not being held to a tight tolerance, but then you get a part drawing that has a super tight tolerance. And maybe it's needed, but if it's not, you can certainly save some money by opening up the tolerance. And then when you migrate from a manual process, you need to look how the products are delivered to the automation. In a manual process, um, an operator can grab a part or he really doesn't care where it's located to put it on a fixture. When you start automating, you need to have the parts in a repeatable placement. So for some processes, you can certainly uh, create 100% automation, uh, but the reality is sometimes it's very difficult to get that last 10%, and the last 10% could be the highest cost. So in some applications, it's okay to get to 80, 90% level of automation, and it can still save you money. So there's certainly a lot of progress in robotic AI, a lot of companies making uh, some very good, very good applications. But the reality is it's still very difficult to duplicate the human eye, the brain, the touch, the feel. So when you're looking at a manual process and what a person can do with, with their eye, with their hand, sometimes it can be very difficult. I mean, robotic AI is solving some of these issues. Um, we're, again, we're making progress, but we're not there today. A couple examples here, some entertainment applications I've worked on. Uh, for example, a robot playing uh, piano. Quite, quite easy for a human to do, but we try to automate that process. Um, again, the timing, the touch and feel of a human, very difficult to automate. Go ahead and run that video, please.
So that video was showing four robots working together to play a song. I mean, it sounds simple, but anybody that knows automation can understand the timing requirements and how difficult it is. Uh, the second video, a couple of robots we put together to create uh, choreographed dance to video and also to music. <laughs> So I know both of those applications are for entertainment purposes, but it just goes to show how difficult it can be to, to duplicate what a human can do. And we'll turn it over to uh, Patrick and Octave for the next section. Thanks, Ron. Next, uh, next slide. So when companies look to automate these labor intensive applications, uh, a common concern that comes up is programming. Uh, the programming method can seriously affect the customer's return on investment. So finding the most efficient programming method is critical for the customer to achieve maximum return on investments. Um, if the programming is too difficult to learn, companies are gonna be reluctant to automate. So the programming uh, solution needs to be easy enough for the current and future employees to grasp and understand. Uh, complex part, part profiles can be hard to replicate. So the programmer needs to have the confidence that he or she can reproduce the, the results consistency, consistently while maintaining um, accuracy. And this goes back to my first statement about uh, ROI, but in high mixed low volume scenarios, programming delays can have serious impacts on delivery times and margins. So the programming method needs to have the ability to quickly adapt to changing parts, customer requests and, and customer demands. Now there are more than two methods to program a robot, but the two most important we're gonna focus on is using the teach pendant and offline programming, uh, OLP. There will always be a place for teach pendant programming when it comes to machine tending, uh, material handling, palletizing type applications, but offline programming solves a lot of issues programmers face today when programming a robot. Um, there are tons of benefits to offline programming, but the, the three most important um, that we'll look at are uh, ease of use, accuracy, and time savings. So when we look at ease of use, Robot Master, for example, provides a simple programming workflow in four easy steps. You first import your CAD model, then you apply your path, you simulate and verify, and then generate your robotic code from there. Uh, it also gives the users with features and, and functionality that allow them to resolve complex robotic issues like singularities, joint limitations, wrist flips, um, reach limitations and, and collisions. All of these types of errors can be uh, very frustrating to a new robotic programmer. Uh, and then we look at accuracy. So Robot Master uh, takes a CAD to path approach. So the users can program complex parts all based off features of the CAD model. And, and further to that, uh, we've also developed specific modules for a variety of applications. For example, we have uh, a contour module we use for more edge following type applications like trimming, deburring, uh, dispensing. Uh, we have other modules we use specifically for polishing and spraying type applications. Uh, and of course, welding applications. Um, you know, as a programmer continues to create and program proven methods, they can save these strategies and recipes in a library that can be later recalled upon. And then the third one, time savings. So time savings can be seen in multiple different ways. So 
of course, the easier the software is to use, that typically means the faster it's going to be to program. Uh, the programmer can also program the robot while it's in production. So as a robot is running a, a job, uh, I can continue to program and work on the next part or, or program multiple cells. And then um, because we're increasing accuracy, we're also improving part quality, right? Which means less post-operation work. And I'll, and I'll use an example for this. So Robot Master being a part of, of Hypertherm, which has a, a fantastic reputation for plasma cutting, we have a lot of customers that are using robotics for plasma cutting. And uh, cut quality is very important to them because that means that they won't have to do as much um, or, or less prep work or grinding prior to the welding stage. Next slide. And further to, to add, you know, in the agenda where I was saying we, we were seeing a lot of interest from, from companies looking to, to automate these types of applications. These are just a few of the applications manufacturers are, are looking to automate. Uh, they're, some are considered labor intensive, they require high accuracy, and they're great candidates for offline programming. Each cell and system can be configured in multiple ways. They can include uh, different brands, models, uh, different rotaries, linear axes, or a combination of rotaries and, and linear axes, uh, end of arm tooling, et cetera, all to fit the customer's need and, and criteria. Uh, and the software is often a key part, not just for the integrator, but the end user as well. For the integrator, they get a software solution that allows them to test each configuration, all based off a path or a program. So they can program a weld path, program a polishing or a spraying routine, and then test and see which configuration works best for the customer. Um, it's also a great presentation tool that allows the customer to visualize what they're buying and how it all works. And, and then, of course, in return, the customer gets a easy to use programming solution that's tested and proven prior to delivery of the system. I'm going to pass it over to Octave now. Thank you, Patrick. All right, so I have, a, um, I have a short video that I would like to share with you today um, that will show the typical steps that we go through when a customer is looking to automate a manufacturing process. So, you know, Roadmaster is a great programming solution uh, which drastically reduces programming time and complexity. But it's also a great tool to help sketch, design, and validate cell layouts, which is going to be a critical step during your transition journey. So what I am uh, about to show uh, you is, um, you know, how we can design and optimize a cell around a job that needs to be automated. All right, so to illustrate my example here, I'm going to um, refer to this part here. So what we wanna do is cut out all the features all the cutouts uh, on this part. So you'll see here, I'm going to start by defining the job and creating a path through the roadmaster is very simple. You just have to select the feature that you want to trim um, at the edge that you want to trim and roadmaster will highlight and create the path automatically for us. You see here that the path turns blue and then you're going to have to implement a bunch of you know, process specific instructions. So things like, for instance, which tool you're going to be using to perform this, uh, those cutouts. What uh, is your competition going to look like? Your point density? How are you going to handle transition moves? Okay, so going from one cutout to the next. And also uh, entry and exit motions. Okay, so how do you want to manage uh, the entry point of your path? Once all, this, all of this is done, you can record all of those settings into presets and re reuse them later on. So you can have you know, anyone essentially programming the robot um, and you don't really need to have that process knowledge, you know, by saving all those presets uh, into a roadmaster. Once this is done, what I want to do is uh, define a couple of different sales. Uh, I want to go with two different options. The first one is going to be, you know, a very simple gantry system where the robot is going to be mounted on um, on the gantry that we see here. So you can pick a, a bunch of components from a predefined library of components that you have pre-built. And then uh, you can uh, manipulate uh, your items in 3D 
and making sure that the layout makes sense. So here I'm just going to go ahead and move the robot and place it onto the mounting plate that we see on the Genshi system. So again, here we try to make things very visual and easy to use. Uh, we want to make sure that you don't have to be a CAD expert nor a CAM expert to be able to program with the Roadmaster. Um, you know, so once once the cell is has been defined, uh, you can inject uh, uh, some knowledge into the cell. And what I mean by this is that um, through Roadmaster, you have the ability to uh, add some automations uh, associated with the cell. So here, for instance, we know that uh, we want the part to go on the workstation that is highlighted into the cell. So what I'm going to do is tell, uh, is identify that position. So next time I open the cell with the part, the part is going to be automatically uh, located in the right location. I'm also going to define which tooling I want to be using for this cell. So here it's going to be a spindle, and that spindle is going to be mounted at the end of the joint six of this robot. So all of these are going to be, you know, the part placement tooling, uh, tooling selection is going to be automated. And finally, what we want to do is define how we're going to check for collisions. So here, obviously, what we want to do is make sure that uh, the robot doesn't collide with the part and the tooling doesn't collide with the part. So we're going to pick from the library of components here and just drag them into the proper uh, area to uh, to define our collision groups. Very easy process. Um, that seems like a, a, a valid option. I'm going to go ahead and go with a second option for my customer. And this time it's going to be, I'm going to be using a track. So the robot is going to be mounted onto onto a track. And you know, that can provide several different benefits for my customers. So, um, you know, by uh, having a robot on a track, you can expand uh, the reach of that robot, right? So that will allow you to cover more area and it will also potentially allow you to have multiple different workstations. So here I'm going to go and uh, define, uh, after I place my robot here, uh, four different workstations along the, the track. And that will allow me essentially to be working on a part while I'm being loading another one into a different location. Okay, so that can help you with cycle time. Um, and then finally, you know, I'm going to um, define uh, the behaviors of my cell again. So here I'm going to, um, you know, identify what is going to be my uh, maximum motion of on the track. And also um, I'm going to, um, you know, implement all the automation that we've uh, we've talked about earlier. So here I have four different stations. I want to make sure that all those stations are being identified so I can automatically have the part located onto the required station as I start programming with Roadmaster. Once this is done, I want to set my collision groups again, and that's going to end my second cell layout. Great, so let's go back to the job. Now we're going to try this job with the two different cells. I'm going to start off with the gantry. And what you see here is that as I um, assign my operation, my part, my job, uh, you'll see that on the left side, we see that the operation, the continuing operation is flagged in red. We have the red bubble here, which identifies that something is wrong. So, uh, you know, based on the workspace analysis that we have here, we can see and identify that some areas along the part are outside of the reach of the robot. So what I'm going to do here is just relocate the part. And you'll see that as I start relocating the part, Roadmaster uh, will reconnect uh, the robot with a part, which shows that you know now we have a valid location. We have a, a location that is within the reach of the robot, and we can see here and validate through uh, the green bubble that we see next to the contouring. Finally, I'm going to um, I'm going to finalize the cell layout um, and relocate that station. So next time I open the part, it's going to go into the proper location. Next time I open the cell, sorry. Um, and then let's go ahead and simulate. So you see here we have a very nice combination. Um, or uh, we have a very nice uh, combo between the programming environment and the cell creation environment. So you can uh, you know, program a job, try to run it, and optimize the layout based uh, on uh, the, the visual feedback that you get into the simulation uh, environment. So you know, that helps you with optimizing the layout to make sure that you know, you're not running into reach problem, you're not running into singularities, you're not running into journey limits, uh, collisions, and so forth. So that seems to be um, that seems to be a, a good option for for what I want to do here. But of course, you know, I want to go ahead and test the second layout that I've created. All right, so let's go ahead and have a look at this here. So you can see here where we have the part on the second station. Everything seems to be green. If you look at the left side panel here, my operations are green. I'm going to go ahead and try all the stations. So station three is also valid. And you can see that as I select the second station, Roadmaster automatically relocate the part to the proper location. 
and recalculates the motion on the track. So uh, the robot is going to move and slide along the track to make sure that you know it's within the reach of all the path sections that I have. So you know those are my two options. Uh, both options uh, options seems to be valid. It's really going to uh, come down to what the customer wants to optimize. If they want to optimize the cost, maybe they're going to go with the first option. If they want to optimize the cycle time, they're probably going to want to go with the second option. So that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Tyson. Thanks, Octave. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, system proposals here and kind of what that looks like. So let's say we've decided to put together a proposal for an automated system. Uh, what are some things that your integrator is going to be looking at to figure out how this needs to come together? Well, we've already talked a bit about robot selection and we've talked a bit about robot programming software. These are both very key threads for a system and thankfully for us, we have great support on those threads from our industry partners here. So for us, the robot aspect can actually end up being kind of the easy part um, where while the magic lies in the smaller details of the system. So just gonna go through a few of those here. Um, considerations for us, how do we get parts in and out of the system? How do we present parts to the robot to actually do the process? Um, what tools are needed on the robot to accomplish the process? Remember the robot is just a vehicle to bring a tool to a location. So those can be conveyors, feeders, fixtures, grippers, spindles, all sorts of different stuff that we would pull from, from industry or design ourselves. How will staff interact, use, and program the system? Um, this is kind of where software like RobotMaster can come in to streamline the ongoing program of the system, how we make sure the process is running correctly, and how we'll keep everyone safe and also comply with safety regulations. And of course, uh, probably most importantly, how will we accomplish all this inside the ROI requirements that are set by our customer? So that was an awful lot of question marks and a lot of things to work on, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, we first wanna make sure that an automated system is gonna make sense for this application without burning up too much time on both sides. So we'll first prepare a budgetary proposal um, for our customer. It's gonna include some proposed layout options, probably a few um, major components and features, estimated production rates, and some budgetary pricing within a you know plus minus range. So if this all looks good, um, and it looks like it'll probably make good business sense to our customer, we'll take things a bit further in order to de-risk the project for both parties. So we'll go ahead and prepare a firm proposal. Um, that's gonna include a finalized layout uh, with components, uh, simulation videos of operation, production rates and constraints, and obviously firm pricing and delivery with some estimates on return investment. So at the end of this, if we've done a, gotten good information and we've done a good job, um, it should be self-apparent that there's a good business case to move forward from here. And uh, now I'll pass things back to Patrick for a quick summary to wrap up. Yeah, thanks, Tyson. Um, so in summary, we shed some light on what we all do uh, for our customers. So the role of the uh, robotic OEM integrator and software solution, uh, questions to ask if you're considering automating, uh, the integration process and, and what to expect, and, and of course, how automating can help increase efficiency, quality, and can be an answer to uh, skilled labor shortages. So um, ultimately, automation doesn't have to be scary. Uh, if you're working with the right integrator, robot brand, and software, the entire process can be uh, seamless from start to finish. So. Thanks again for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for the webinar. I hope everyone was able to gain some value from this. And uh, I'm going to hand it back to Clarissa to field some audience questions. Thank you so much, guys, for a great presentation. We've had several audience questions come in. Um, so I'm just going to start and, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So um, if you guys could all come up on camera, that would be great. Um, our first question is for Ron. So Ron, what is the most common issue companies have with um, when trying to automate a manual process? 
Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, a very good question. One of the biggest problems I've seen with, with companies trying to automate is trying to do too much on their own or actually trying to do everything on their own. I mean, certainly, I've seen customers successful with doing their own automation, but in general, they, they end up wasting time and money. So again, the value of the integrator, like Tyson mentioned some of the key points in his presentation, integrators bring a lot of value to the process. Thank you. Um, our next question looks like it's for Tyson. So Tyson, does a process need to be the same every time um, in order to be automated? Uh, no, um, but the variety in a process might affect the software we're going to select. Um, you know, Robot Master is a good example of that. Sensors, cameras, or fixtures required in the system to, to make it a successful project. Um, I think the key there is to make sure that the variations are well understood by the integrator and vendors and everyone else that's working on the project. Um, I think Ron also mentioned in his presentation that sometimes it's not worth chasing that 100% uh, in a project. And you know, if you want to get a good return on investment, sometimes it's good to set a limit on excluding a couple of really oddball aspects of the, the process just to, uh, to simplify it a bit. Thank you. Um, this question looks like it's for Patrick or Ott, so I'll just ask it. Um, how many training days do you guys recommend for the software? Hawk Dave, I'll, uh, I'll jump in and answer this one. So uh, the recommended amount of training typically varies based on application complexity, uh, but can range anywhere from two days to even four days. Um, some of the, I guess, standardized applications that we deal with, trimming, deburring, that sort of thing can be um, done or completed and, and have the user comfortable with the software within a couple of days. Uh, and then more advanced applications like polishing, for example, or spraying where a lot of fine tuning is required uh, in the three or four day uh, range there. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Tyson. If your product is basically custom on every run, is it worth trying to develop robotic welding with the technology right now? Um, I mean, it, it's hard to say if it's definitely worth it or not, but that's kind of where the early discovery phase um, of these projects comes into play. Um, likely it is. And um, there's a lot that can be done, especially with um, offline programming and, and database integration to pull um, features of parts into the robot so that um, the parts can be different part to part. But I think the, the real important thing is, is making sure that um, those variations are understood um, early on so we can figure out if there's a good ROI there. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for you. Deburring applications are difficult, so how successful is the Robot Master software for following accurately a complex edge accurately? Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking. Um, uh, you know, Roadmaster is um, we have a we have a great product for deburring applications. We have a uh, product that is uh, all in one product. So you know, every components are uh, within one product: the uh, path creation component, um, the uh, robot programming component, and we always make sure they're, that they're easy to use. We make sure that we provide, you know, visual tools that allows you to program those deburring applications with, you know, very limited robotic knowledge and very limited CAM knowledge as well. Uh, so, you know, deburring that's really, you know, something that we do very well with Roadmaster. Um, you know, sometimes we have a lot of customers that work with, uh, you know, force sensors to be able to make sure that, you know, you're on the path because I think that's what that was also you know, uh, a part of your question, how to make sure that we're accurate. So we're gonna have to work with some, you know, um, hardware components to be able to help with this, but you know, that's not, not something that we're, that's something that we're very comfortable with. Thank you. Patrick, this next question is for you. Is there one or a best software simulation and or programming tool that will suffice for all or most robot vendors products? Um, yeah, Robot Master. Um, 
Uh, yeah, that's no, no, a difficult uh, question to to answer. Um, you know, really, what uh, we specialize in um, is um, you know the high mix, low volume type scenarios. I, I think if you look back or, or go back to one of the slides that I covered, um, OEM softwares and teach pendants uh, definitely have uh, a need in the industry and have a purpose for specific applications. But when it comes to complex applications uh, for both programming and simulation, uh, we we feel we provide a, a unique solution and a user-friendly solution to, to our customers. Thank you. Ron, this next question is for you. You've talked about labor shortages being a driver for automation. What do you see as the main reason to automate in other countries where labor is cheap and available? A good question, thank you. <clears throat> If you're not competing on price, it's typically quality or reliability of, of the process. I mean, unfortunately, humans are only able to stay within their capabilities. So if you're trying to produce quality products, sometime introducing uh, human error can cause issues with the product. So product quality would be the biggest driver, which would, of course, drive cost. All right, thank you. Um, and then this will be our last question. Tyson, it's for you. Should we automate the hardest jobs first or the easiest jobs first? Uh, so I'm gonna sound like a bit of a broken record here, but um, we should automate the jobs with the best return on investment first. Um, now saying that more often than not, the simpler processes end up being able to be automated at a lower cost to be able to still get reliability out of it. Um, so. Frequently with customers, we'll see um, people want to bring us to some of the more challenging, uh, difficult processes that they have trouble with. And, and sometimes it's worth looking at what is the total cost of automating that versus something that's um, a little bit more straightforward. All right, um, gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time, for giving us um, this great presentation and answering our audience questions. We did have a few more, but we will email those too, so you can get back to our audience directly. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So please join us this time next week for our next webinar. It's automation in a post-pandemic world. We'll talk to several automation companies to learn how they innovated and adapted to the challenges the pandemic provided and what processes they will keep using moving forward. So you can learn more and register for free at automate.org forward slash webinars. And I hope you found this webinar to be interesting and informative. If you have any questions about A3 or today's webinar, please reach out to either Robot Master or myself via the contact information you see on the screen. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you in the next 24 hours. Thanks again to Patrick, Octave, Ron, and Tyson for a great discussion, Robot Master for their sponsorship, and to all of our listeners for your support. Stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.